like to talk about inclusion and how the innovation that it inspires benefits all of us. Now, some of you may be wondering what an English-speaking, educated, heterosexual, cisgendered, Caucasian male is doing up here talking about inclusion. I've really never been excluded from anything in my life. But I'm an advocate for a huge group of people who have largely been ignored and excluded from many aspects of our society. And I'm talking about the 40 million people in the United States who have at least one disability. That number grows enormously if we talk about the worldwide population. And now we all understand the concept of a disability, but by applying such a negative label to folks who have one, we're doing them a disservice. So let's get rid of that prefix, dis, which literally means apart, and instead focus on able or ability and call our friends differently abled. I'd like to share with you my journey with the differently abled and inclusion and inclusion enabled design. See, I've been teaching engineering design at Stanford University for 14 years. And in the past, I did that by looking at historical failures. And I would have students analyze them. And then I would teach them a process to follow. That if they did, presumably, disasters would be avoided in the future. And as part of that work, I just realized that I love to teach. And so I thought I'd give back to the local community here. And I volunteered to teach engineering concepts in the community high school in the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math. And it was there that I met a young man named Zach Crichton. Zach has cerebral palsy. He's wheelchair-abled, and he can't speak. And I'm ashamed to say that when I first met Zach, that I made some very incorrect assumptions about his intellect. Why is it, by the way, that when we see someone who's wheelchair-abled or who looks differently than us, that we so often make incorrect inferences about them? Why is it that we tend to focus on human struggle and human challenge rather than human potential? Is it because when we see someone who is not whole that we somehow assume they're incomplete? I'm not sure why we do this. I sadly did it with Zach, and I know that we can change it. So while I continued to work with Zach through his paraeducator, we bonded on some great topics like recycling and sustainability and mathematics. In fact, I was doing some math with Zach the other day, and he never ceases to amaze me how quickly he can solve problems in his head. And at the same time I was working with Zach, I was teaching my students at Stanford. And I had this realization that they really weren't that much different that Zach just lacks a means of self-expression. And by that, I mean all of his thoughts and vision and wisdom. There's no simple way for him to get those out of his head and communicated directly to us. I further thought that my students would benefit from this realization, that there's a young man just like them, except for this lack of means of self-expression. So I set up a Skype conference call between Zach and my class at Stanford. The students got to meet Zach over the internet, and I gave them a problem, an engineering problem, related to his wheelchair. They loved trying to solve this problem. They really enjoyed it. And that inspired me to create a new class at Stanford 
that looked at the concepts of engineering design, not through examination of historical failures, but by looking through the lens of the differently abled. So I ran this idea by my teaching assistant, Danielle Lucas. Danny was majoring in behavior design at the time, a senior, and she said she was all in. You see, Danny has a brother, Justin, who's also differently abled. And she said, I will give you whatever support you need to make this class happen. So after she finished with her final exams, last fall, we sat down, we hammered out a syllabus, a course description. I submitted the requisite paperwork, and our new class, Dare to Care, Compassionate Design, was born. Taught it for the first time at Stanford last spring, and I'm teaching it right now, this fall. This is a true engineering course, and in fact, it's one of the first in the School of Engineering at Stanford that meets Stanford's requirement for all undergraduates on engaging diversity. So we teach the concepts of engineering design by challenging the students to solve problems that are confronted by the differently abled. But beyond the concepts of engineering design, we wanted to teach the students to approach design with empathy. We wanted them to embrace the notion that they should consider how all humans interact with designed objects. And we wanted to do that not by showing them slides on a screen, but by having them interact face to face, hand to hand, hand to prosthesis if, if necessary with differently abled people. We wanted them to live this experience. And we also thought, what better way to launch the class than to have the young man who inspired it travel from Friday Harbor to Palo Alto and meet these Stanford students so they could experience his spirit. Now, I knew logistically that this would be very difficult. You see, Zach needs to travel with his wheelchair. It's his home base. It's his comfort zone. And doing that via commercial air service would be super difficult. So after long search, I found a wonderful man who donated his time and his aircraft. And he brought Zach, Zach's mother, Zach's paraeducator, Zach's STEM teacher, and myself down to Palo Alto and back. Zach was a star at Stanford. His mother told me that this trip literally changed the trajectory of his life. And one of the reasons she said that happened was because when she saw him and what he was capable of in front of all these students, there was no way he was getting away with so much in the future. <laughs> the students asked Zach lots of questions. And of course, they all had to be formulated with yes or no answers, because that's the only way that Zach can respond. I gave them a design problem related to the headrest on Zach's chair. You see, that headrest sometimes doesn't support his head well. And when that happens, his head droops. And when his head droops, Zach drools. And Zach has told us that's demeaning to him. That's a problem that he wants solved. Students did a great job, came up with some wonderful designs, and I hope to see them someday on wheelchairs like Zach's in the future. Now, our students didn't just get to meet Zach. They met many other wonderful and inspiring, differently abled people, one of whom was Adrian Rodriguez. Adrian's low vision. He's completely blind in one eye and 2,400 in the other. So what that means is what you can see from 400 feet away, Adrian has to be but 20 feet to have the same experience. Oh, and he graduated in 2016 from Stanford with a degree in computer science. He did this through hard work and perseverance. He had to sit in the front row of his classes with a telescope so he could look up through it and just see a small portion of what the professor was 
transcribing on the board. Adrian told the, the students a story about when he, how when he was young and his parents were trying to get him into public schools. And one administrator said, okay, but he has to have a glass eye. His parents complied with the request and Adrian wore the prosthesis, but it was incredibly painful. In fact, it was so painful that after a short amount of time, he refused to wear it. And isn't it sad that someone's notion of inclusion was to make Adrian's outward appearance different for their own comfort? This is not what's next. Indeed, if our idea of inclusion is to make the differently abled look normal, then I submit it's we who are disabled. We gave the students an assignment to design a device to help Adrian with certain tasks. They did a wonderful job. Adrian is actually headed to Thailand in a few weeks. He's going to teach blind people computer programming using tactile aids. Just amazing. So why inclusive design? I can think of four main reasons why we should be inclusive in our designs. The first thing, it is unquestionably the right thing to do. Who on earth wants to be excluded? Number two, regulatory. There are actually laws that say we must be inclusive in certain aspects of our design, mostly from the architectural perspective. The third reason is the market. 40 million people in the United States alone, that's 15% of the population. And by the way, by looking around this room, I can tell that by virtue of aging in the not too distant future, some of us are gonna be differently abled. <laughs> We're gonna be, wanna be part of that market. The fourth reason is untapped intellect. By being inclusive in our designs, we can tap into the knowledge and wisdom of the differently abled. And you'll see shortly that that produces benefits for all of us. But no matter what the reason, one thing that's clear is inclusion needs to be in the forefront of design. It cannot be an afterthought. And to that end, a group of companies has started a program called Teach Access. Teach Access got wind of Dare to Care, and they invited Adrian and I over to the accessibility lab at Yahoo to see what the latest and greatest was. And there we saw the efforts that Teach Access was engaging in to teach professors how to teach students the industry best practices in inclusive design and coding. All of these companies participate in Teach Access. These are household names. They want students that are coming out of the best universities to already know, to already have these tools in their pocket, to already know what the best practices are in inclusion and accessible coding. So what happens when we're inclusive in our designs? I think you guys are going to be really surprised about the tools that you use every single day that had their genesis in inclusion. Texting. Texting was started in the mid-1970s by Vinton Cerf, the father of the internet. He was looking for a better way to communicate between himself and his friends who were all hard of hearing. Speech synthesis was actually developed in the mid-1930s at Bell Labs as a means to help the deaf speak more intelligibly. Optical character recognition, OCR, this is the feat of taking typewritten text and getting it into a computer 
in a format that it's more usable. This was developed in the mid-1970s as a way to give the blind access to more types of media. But beyond the realm of computers, there's many tools that you use every day that I'm sure you had no idea had their genesis and inclusion. The telephone. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in the late 1870s. His mother and his wife were both deaf. He was doing research on how to enable the deaf with better means of communication. Out came the telephone. Recorded music was developed in the mid-1930s as a means to give long playing music and literature accessibility to the blind. A device called the Reed Phone was developed and later turned into 33 and a third RPM records and you know what happened after that. The Huddle. On weekends this time of year, we see football players gathered in huddles the huddle was developed at Gallaudet University, a school for the deaf, so that deaf football players could call plays. Amazing. So we can see what happens when we're inclusive in our designs. And the same way that Martin Luther King did not want his children to be excluded when he said that one day he has a dream that one day his children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream that Zach Crichton will not be judged by the posture of his body, but rather by the strength of his spirit. I have a dream that Adrian Rodriguez will not be judged by the cloudiness of his eye, but rather the clarity of his vision to help others. And I have a dream that people who cannot speak will one day have a voice that will let them express their wisdom to us. And now Zach is going to tell you about his dream. Hi, my name is Zach Crichton. I may be speaking in someone else's voice, but these are my thoughts. My dream is to be able to talk to people, to let them know that I'm an intelligent person with thoughts and feelings just like them, and to share my wicked sense of humor. I'll leave you with this quote from Charlotte Bronte. I am no bird and no net ensnares me. I'm a free human being with an independent will. Thank you. Thank you.